Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Frischi, uh, presenting remotely from The Flower to the Field, Global Examples of Best Practices for Collecting Seeds from the Wild for Use in Restoration. Um, as part of the INSR Symposium about Seed-Based Restoration, Innovations, Opportunities, and Challenges. The co-authors are Kingsley Diction, Candido Galvez Ramirez, Stacy Jacobson, Maria Tudela Isanta, and Greg Libovich. We're going to illustrate wild collection with examples from our work in five locations around the globe. We start in Europe and Italy, then Spain, and then go to North America, to Indiana and California, and we save the best for last with Bolivia here in South America. As far as situations, we deal with high elevation in Italy. We look at mechanized harvest of semi-natural populations in Spain, issues related to high diversity restoration in Indiana, how to work with volunteers in wild seed collection in California, and collecting geocarpic species in Bolivia, or collecting seeds from underground. The objectives for the talk today are ultimately to improve seed-based restoration and wild seed collection outcomes. For each example and location, we'll show the objectives and purpose for doing the wild collection and also the best practices suggested for that scenario, and finally, the lessons learned from that experience. So first to Northern Italy, where alpine meadows have lost herbaceous diversity due to woody encroachment and undergrazing. Biopa was a proof of concept project to demonstrate the use of seeds to restore these meadows. Healthy meadows support the local livelihood of bitto cheese production. The photos here show the source of milk, which are both goats and cows, uh, inside one of the stone huts for cheese making, a milking station uh, located remotely out in the meadow, and finally a big feast featuring the bitto cheese. The objectives here for the wild seed collection were to have a seed source to use in restoring alpine summer pastures, both for direct seeding and to grow transplants. And additionally, the seeds were conserved in, as accessions in a germplasm bank. So the photo here um, actually doesn't show seed collection. It shows a later stage in the work uh, where we're doing transplanting of the plants that were grown from wild collected seeds at the restoration site. And the white fencing is part of a study to compare the effects of grazing and, and not grazing on the plant community. So the best practices in this work that were for each municipality where collections were made, a separate permit request was necessary. Additionally, to minimize the effect on the populations, we collected less than 20% of the seeds and also collected from multiple populations. So an important lesson here was to know the phenology of the target species in order to plan the site visits. In these communities, the Poaceae matured earlier than the Ranunculaceae and Gentianaceae, so we needed to plan multiple collecting trips to get mature seeds from all taxa of interest. And it's really high altitude with no shade, um, so it's important to be aware of intense radiation. Protect yourself and don't let windy or cool temperatures fool you. And really use midday to rest and refuel in the shade of an outcrop and have a lunch break for a few hours. Now to southern Spain or Andalusia, where 30% of land cover uh, is an olive orchard. This is really the heart of global olive production. The situation that we're looking at here are, are simplified agroecosystems of olive monoculture. The goals are to use native seeds to establish semi-natural understory to restore ecosystem services. Below on the left side is an olive orchard with native cover crops and in that same photo on the right is a conventionally managed olive orchard with bare soil which is also what the photo on the upper right shows. 
There is a very limited supply of native seed mixtures or appropriate plant materials for establishing native cover. The work that has been done so far is to shape and manage the spontaneous vegetation and to harvest that and use it as a seed supply for mixes or to establish other seed production areas. The spontaneous vegetation had been managed with selective herbicide and timed mowing to create a community of short annual grasses which protect against erosion and don't interfere with olive farming. Primarily the grasses here in the photo are from the genus Bromus. Once the spontaneous vegetation had been managed, it was time to harvest the seeds from it. And over the years, we first tried several other pieces of farm equipment. First, a construction sweeper. Uh, many farmers already had that, but it didn't work very well. Then a hay baler, which also had some issues. And finally, we decided to buy a plot combine. And that's what's shown here. It's a really effective way to get in between the trees and also to harvest really only the seeds. So again, in trying all the different pieces of equipment, uh, some of the lessons learned are don't harvest the vegetation unless you've managed it uh, to the point where it has the desired species composition because then if you collect all the seeds and material, separating out the, the seeds of unwanted species is often... Um, very difficult. And secondly, the, what the photo shows here uh, is the result of the earlier use of a hay baler. And the issue there is, of course, um, often to do mechanical harvest compared with hand harvest. Mechanical harvest should be done at a, a bit greener stage because all the shaking of the machinery can cause more seed loss. So, um, what you also get then as a consequence is that you harvest more wet or moist plant material. So you really also should be prepared to deal with the, the humidity and the volume of material. So here that's shown spread out and drying in one of the seed uh, areas. But again, for, for this project, the, the use of the combine ultimately was a really successful solution. Cleaning. So next, to Indiana in the United States for an example of wild collecting for high diversity restoration using local ecotype seed. This restoration, here shown in the green areas on the map, was done to connect prairie remnants and create genetic flow between populations in the isolated remnants which are shown in tan. Um, over about 12 years, more than 600 native species were sown across 2,800 hectares. The objectives for the wild seed collecting in this case were to capture the local genetic diversity to use in the seed mixes and also to establish seed production beds at a nursery. The wild collection complemented the nursery production um, with seeds of species that aren't necessarily amenable to seed farming or which are more rare or conservative. Some of the best practices that came out of this work were, again, collecting from multiple populations to capture genetic diversity and also collecting a conservative amount of seeds from each population. In this case, um, not more than 10 to 20 percent. Something that's especially valuable as well is that by doing wild collection, the practitioners and collectors are constantly uh, visiting the remnant communities and observing them. And that really helps to have those as reference ideas um, and examples for how the target restoration vegetation is shaped. The lessons learned here were that um, because we were collecting so many species from so many sites, we had to get permits to collect from public lands at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as from conservation organizations and private individuals. Each authority has their own permitting and reporting system um, to follow and track. So record keeping is really important for knowing and using multiple source populations. It's also important for being able um, to use multiple populations when creating the nursery beds for seed production. 
So shown here is a publication from Restoration Ecology um, with this project as the case study where it showed that, yes, the genetics of the wild populations were successfully captured um, in the seed production beds. Now moving westward across North America, we go to California and the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. This is a group of federally owned lands near the city of San Francisco, the large population center of potential volunteers to help and participate in seed collecting. This is high diversity work with hundreds of species collected each year across over a thousand collection events. And often there are new species to work with and so this work requires a lot of preparation, uh, streamlining, and flexibility. The objectives for collecting seeds from the wild are to use them to grow plants that will be transplanted into degraded areas. For that reason, genetically appropriate and pathogen-free seeds are key. Also, by being so near to a large city, there is a lot of interaction with the public through teaching and volunteer events and other restoration activities. Working with volunteers to do wild seed collecting is a great way to get work done and to engage the local community in caring for and supporting restoration work. The best practices from this project are to, for the coordinator to keep a detailed calendar of collection dates, priorities, quantities, and ID notes to help in coordinating and leading the volunteer collectors. Also, to protect the wild populations and capture genetic diversity, it's suggested to collect throughout the ripening period, collect a maximum of 5% of the standing seed crop, and aim to collect from at least 60 individuals. Uh, since these seeds are going into container production, it's important to be mindful of practices to reduce pathogen contamination. Currently, the soil-borne fungus Phytophthora is a big problem in California nurseries, so a good practice here is to avoid collecting fruits from the ground and only collect fruits that are still held up in the air on the plant. Often, um, ahead of the work with volunteers, the professional seed collector will make scouting trips to locate the populations and then later bring volunteers to the location. To find the populations, use perspective and the seed collector's eye to identify pockets of similar plants suggested to get down and search at ground level too. When leading novice or volunteer collectors, provide them training in key ways to distinguish the target plant from other plants. Discuss visual and tactile characteristics, and also use terms or methods, like how do the plants sway in the breeze, um, things that aren't necessarily in keys or guidebooks to help novices distinguish plants. In using seeds for propagation in this case, it's important to keep timelines in mind um, in case there are species that uh, need to be sown green if they're recalcitrant, or species with some dormancy that need proper stratification in a longer period um, before they can be sown and germinated. Uh, another suggestion for working with volunteer collectors is to check in with them regularly while out in the field to make sure they're getting the correct seeds in their bags and also make it a priority to keep everyone safe and comfortable in the field. And when using paper bags, often the seams or corners can leak, so just use some tape um, and then your bags of seed will be very secure. Our final destination is southeastern Bolivia in Chuquisaca and work that was done in a protected area, uh, the Enyao National Park and Integrated Management Area. This area allows some integrated use, such as farming. The target species were wild peanut relatives. Uh, peanuts originated in this part of South America and to center of diversity for the wild relatives. There's a few examples shown here um, on the right. As part of valuing and protecting the resource, we inventoried the area and made seed collections. 
positive identification of taxa in the genus Arrakis require the fruits. So seed collection was also critical for documenting which species we found. And this is the genus Arrakis, which is geocarpic. So the flowers are above ground, but then the ovary grows and develops to form a peg, which drives itself down into the ground. The seeds and fruits develop there for several months. They're annuals that are low growing and due to their lack of dispersal, the distribution is in population clusters. So therefore, one of the best practices for dealing with a geocarpic species with this type of distribution is to work with locals. Talk with them because they walk the area all the time and know it well. And they were really critical in this project for pinpointing the locations of the populations. It was also nice to work with them and show um, the external interest from the researchers to raise the value of the plants and protecting them uh, to the local community members who ultimately can really protect them. And finally with geocarpy, I guess the lessons learned and suggestions are just to realize the limitations. So again, uh, populations are very small because dispersal is limited and also because the species does not produce many seeds or fruits uh, per individual. Also, you can't see the fruits or seeds ahead of time to evaluate their maturity because they're underground. Yet, because the populations are small, you really want to avoid digging up too many plants prematurely. But then on the other hand, if you wait too long, there are free-ranging pigs that can find the fruits first and dig them up and beat you to them, which is what's shown here um, in the top right. And in the bottom left, is another problem, heavy rains can come and saturate the soil and cause rotting of the fruits underground. And the result of this work was a, a short publication in a Bolivian journal uh, where we were able to document the species that were found. So thank you all for reviewing some wild seed collection examples with us. Uh, from Spain, we'd like to thank Rafa Soler and Joaquin Baena. From Indiana, thank you to Elisa Nyberg. And from California, thank you to Annette Russell and Elisa Shore. And in Bolivia, we thank Renaldo Lozano, Martha Serrano, and Eloy Blanco, and the people of the communities of Uva Viranti, Caretindi, Pintirenda, and Rosario del Ingre. And finally, here's my contact information. Again, I apologize for not being able to attend in person, but please contact me um, if you have any further questions or comments. And um, for each country, we put a few links to those project sites. Um, and as I understand, these presentations will be online, so you can access these websites that way. Thank you very much.